there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. I grew up in D.C. eating the standard American diet. Meat, dairy, fruit, veggies, bread. And I remember my grandma would make me these big breakfasts with like sausage, eggs, and fluffy butter biscuits. You know, I live for them. And at the time, I never questioned what I ate. If it tasted good, I ate it and got seconds. So what are you making? I'm making some turkey legs and turkey wings, spaghetti on a salad. My entire family eats meat, so that's what I knew, and that's all I knew. By the time I became a teenager, I had heard of vegetarianism, but I had no idea what a vegan was. And then when I was 20, I moved to Los Angeles, and that's where I learned what a vegan was. I was like, hmm. You know, that's that white people stuff. It's all love. It's all love. But then I worked on a lifestyle series where we were interviewing Bobette Davis, the owner of this vegan restaurant called Stuff I Eat. She was 65 at the time, and her body trumped mine. She was the first black female vegan that I ever met. I don't eat no meat, no dairy, no sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. She unknowingly inspired me to read up on plant-based diets, and the more I read, the more I became inspired to go vegan. Every culture has a relationship with food, and African Americans are no different. What we have, however, is a very vexed relationship with food. I think because we've been told that we ate low on the hog, if you will, we have been chastised and talked about with regard to what is referred to as soul food. And so I like to empower African-American people to understand where their food comes from. Just making like a homemade base, just olive oil, garlic. I hate to be ignorant, but it tastes like white people food. <laughs> it doesn't taste like white people food to me. <laughs> I feel like white people food is a lot less flavorful. Exactly. Like, exactly. Really. The garlic paste would have not been. Yeah, if the garlic was removed, then mm -hmm. it would taste like white people. Yeah. It's, it's like a... mm -hmm. That was so ignorant that we're calling it white people. I know. I know. When I initially identified veganism as a white thing, it was because I didn't know my history. To associate veganism and vegetarianism with whiteness, you're totally discounting our cultural heritage. A lot of our histories have been erased because of colonialism that's embedded in K-12 education. Black people were not abducted and put on ships and enslaved as someone who didn't understand anything, didn't know how to raise land, didn't have any spiritual ideas, didn't have other ideas around nutrition or harvesting the land. When you look at traditional West African diets, they are diets that are plant-based, low in fat, and also contain very little meat. West Africans who were used to eating this traditional West African diet were essentially dragged from their homes, shipped across the ocean, and then confined to plantations where they were literally fed the garbage of the plantation. It didn't dawn on me at that time that my ancestors come from a rich land with rich soil and rich farmers. All I knew was we turn scraps into soul food, and I thought that was our only culinary legacy. And that's the most pervasive narrative, primarily because the majority of African Americans were in the South. But first of all, I challenge people to think about where the South is. People are eating different things depending upon where they were located during the period of enslavement. If you're in the Southwest, you necessarily have access to more peppers, and if you're on the Chesapeake, you have access to the water. People foraged, they went into the woods, and they found berries and they found other greenery. We need to be very careful about how we talk about our food cultures as if we're a monolithic culture, because we're not. And historically, many of our political leaders have rejected meat and embraced healthy, plant-based food ways. Coretta Scott King and her son, Dexter Scott King, vegans. 
radical feminist and activist, Angela Davis, is a vegan. Rosa Parks was a vegetarian. I was a sophomore at Amherst College and our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus to talk about the state of Black America. Our Black Student Union knew him as a civil rights icon, as a humorist. We did not know that he had become vegetarian and vegan and raw. He was actually mentored by Dr. Alvina Fulton, who was a naturopathic doctor who opened the very first health food store on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s. She's just one example. The father of raw gourmet cuisine is Aris Latam from Panama. And you have Rastafarians who tend to follow an Ital diet, which is a clean way of eating designed for health and vitality, mostly organic, non-processed foods with very few animal products, if any. So plant-based eating has many historic roots in the black culture. It's not a white thing, and not knowing that is an ignorant thing. In my career, I've been told that the foods that define soul food lexicon are Southern foods. So it becomes soul specifically assigned to black people because in the 60s, Amiri Baraka, Eldridge Cleaver, and other black nationalists wanted to make the argument that black people had culture. We have culture in our language, we have culture in our clothing, we have culture in our food. I'm from the Midwest, grew up in St. Louis, so uh, the kind of foods that I ate was, you know, a lot of barbecue and a lot of ribs, a lot of, you know, try tip brisket. Well, I ain't get brisket too. I got a little money. I'm sorry, I'll be honest with you. We ain't have brisket enough. I'm just talking. I ain't get brisket to like two summers ago. It's funny because before I went vegan, I didn't like a lot of soul food. Like I didn't eat cornbread, macaroni and cheese, potato salad stuff. And I ain't like none of that. And people will always say to me, like, girl, you ain't black. So you can imagine, once I went vegan, my black card got completely revoked. Probably about 15 years ago now, I was at a party and I just happened to mention or answer a question and say that I was vegan. I think why I wasn't eating something at the party. And this woman overheard me and she looked at me and rolled her eyes and just looked me up and down and said, you mean you haven't had a piece of fried chicken in 15 years? And I said, no, I guess I, you know, I never thought about it. And uh, she just rolled her eyes and walked away and just sat down and shook her head at me. That was the first time that really, really it hit me that someone could think that I wasn't black enough because I wasn't eating soul food. But I learned veganism and vegetarianism from black people. Why should your black card be forfeit? Because you have decided that your health and wellness is not predicated on eating like animal proteins or consuming animal secretions in your body. Your black card should be contingent on your commitment to black liberation and not on these stereotypes that have been handed down to us by other people. Your rejection of those stereotypes I think speaks more to who we are as individuals than anything else. Your black card might get taken away though if you have not seen the color purple. There's this conflicting dichotomy in black America. Like on the one hand, we hate when we're stereotyped. But on the other hand, we criticize blacks for stepping outside of those stereotypes. Like if you're black and you're not a Democrat, Uncle Tom. If you're black and you ain't Christian, you a heretic. If you don't get down with soul food, you bougie. This is societal. It's not particular. We don't allow people to have choice because we feel that your choices somehow reflect me. Veganism carries such a heavy definition. It means so much more to so many people. Veganism is an activist term. I think African Americans shy away from that because they're like, we don't want all of that. I don't want to be the annoying vegan, you know, that, oh, I'm a vegan. But at the same time, I almost want to be the example that wasn't there for me. Growing up, I saw movies like Soul Food, which represented black food culture, but in a very stereotypical way. Yeah, we did have Soul Food back in the day. And in season seven now of The Walking Dead, seeing Morgan being a vegan in this post-apocalyptic dystopian universe where people are eating whatever they can. 
and girlfriends as well. The character Lynn, she was played by Persia White. She was a vegan. She was the first black female vegan I remember actually seeing on TV. So because a lot of images of black female vegans aren't really that mainstream, it's foreign to a lot of people in the black community. Even the black church is starting to set better examples. It used to be that we go to church and we're in church all day long and you would have dinner and so forth at the church. You knew what you were going to have, right? We always knew you were going to get your fried chicken, your greens, there was ham, there was pound cake. You looked forward to that because it was a part of a ritual. Nowadays, we're also choosing foods that are going to say we believe in this healthy way of living. And so you, you end up with a lot of baked food, which is not a bad thing at all. And I've been told about communities where the church has inserted itself in a very major way to say, we are not going to let our congregation die of heart disease and diabetes. Health is not simply about diet. We're going to get a little bit more into that in just a moment. But we tell ourselves with that. And so we've created this atmosphere that simply says, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do that. And then there are some of us who don't drink and don't smoke and will look at the person who consumes alcohol as if they are doing something that is completely unhealthy. But yet while we are not consuming alcohol, we're loaded up on sugar. No, 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 you don't have wine before you go to bed. It's just butter pecan. <laughs> but see, that butter pecan ain't in Leviticus, is it? It would be total anarchy if you close all the Popeyes. That's all I'm saying. Anarchy. It'd be like the movie Purge. There's a folklore that says you could tell where the African Americans, black people had been, the Negroes, the coloreds had been, because you could just follow the trail of chicken bones. The Chicken Bone Express, right, is what it was called. So again, what I try to do with my work is empower people with those stories. I'm like, yeah, they're funny and so forth, but that's part of our history. There's no need to be ashamed. The shame comes in when you don't know the history and you allow other people to tell it to you, in which case it gets distorted. At the same time, knowing that and being able to counter that, I think you have a better chance of responding from a position of empowerment versus one of subjugation. I used to love fried chicken, and I'm not even coming from a coon in place, just being real. Like whenever you go to gatherings and there was always this big mountain, this pile of golden crispy fried chicken and this like 14 by 16 aluminum pan. Anyway, obviously when I became a vegan, that had to go. And I hear a lot of people say, I don't know how you can go without chicken. And that's real, like I totally get it. It is one of the harder things to give up. Be honest. Come on, everybody try to act all sophisticated, but if you was gonna eat some, you gonna go get some Popeyes, man, find out. And wouldn't nobody even judge you. I'd be looking at you like, what the wings taste like? The wings good, ain't they? You get spicy. A food like chicken also for many African Americans, because they came through the South perhaps or had family members who came through the South, it became a staple on many Sunday dinner tables. And so it's a comfort food, it's a familiar food, it's a food that reminds people of home and family. And so part of the I can't give it up is as much about taste as it is about connection and again belonging. Foods like fried chicken that are associated with black culture are denounced by dominant culture, you know, it just comes off as an attack on black food ways. And since we're constantly criticized, you know, like our music is too violent, our clothes look too ghetto, our English ain't good enough. You know, there's a big difference between saying, go vegan because soul food is evil, don't eat it anymore. And let's build on soul food. Let's see how we can preserve our legacy and still be healthy. I honestly don't remember the last time I went to a funeral where someone died of old age. It's always degenerative disease, cancer, heart problems, lupus, but it's never old age.
Now, as I read more and more vegan literature, there was this reoccurring theme that meat and dairy especially were linked to a lot of the diseases. When I was in my early 20s, I appeared healthy, but I struggled. I had severe pain and bloating when it was that time of the month. I had internal hemorrhoids, so I bled every time I defecated. I would constantly get yeast and bacterial infections, which is an embarrassing problem for a woman because you don't want men to think you're baking bread down there. When I went vegan, all of those problems went away and I no longer needed the antibiotics, the pain pills, the creams. That is when I learned the real healing power of food. If you can eat your medicine as far as in the foods, there's no reason to take in a pharmaceutical, which has side effects. And the side effects, one being that somebody had to die or some animal had to die for you to get over acid reflux, when you shouldn't have acid reflux in the first place. In theory, if you can start to eat better, eat cleaner, feel stronger, your body is taking the nutrients from the food that you eat and healing itself, or you can just go ahead and drink your nine Pepsis and then eventually you got to deal with your diabetes and you're going to have to deal with that till your foot get cut off. And I ain't going with the grimmest possibility of just saying your foot go get cut off. If what you eat causes your disease, stop the disease by changing what you eat. For example, if you have diabetes, you go to a vegan, whole foods, pattern of food consumption, your diabetic state reverses itself. You no longer have a diabetic condition internally. My dad had diabetes and he basically weaned himself off of his insulin. Like, he just changed his eating habits and, he, and the doctors, exactly, and the doctors kept telling him, you know, you need to take insulin, you need to take insulin. He just changed his eating habits, changed the different stuff that he was eating. And Daddy, how long have you been off of your insulin? Uh, since uh, October last year. Yeah, so it's about wow. to be a year. So many things related to their diet that they would never, ever want to accept. Like, they just don't believe in it, even to the, the moment you would just tell them, like, look, man, the pork chops killing you. You'd be like, eh, eat pork chops. I've been eating these pork chops. Hopefully I would have African Americans coming in telling me, oh, doc, I've got spastic colon or I've got irritable bowel disease. And I would tell them, look, what I want you to do is eliminate all dairy foods from your diet for two weeks come back and see me and let's see if the problem clears up. And I would say that in at least eight cases out of 10, the problem disappeared. There's a very strong association between habitual consumption of dairy foods and prostate cancer. It significantly raises the risk of prostate cancer and prostate cancer is a major problem for African-American males. So what's going on with your diet? Man, so the beginning of the year, cut out all meat, man. And uh, it was going real well. But I relapsed. Relapsed tremendously, <laughs> terrible, bad, bad, bad. But it's so funny because once I did that, as soon as I started eating the processed food, the fast foods, the meat, man, heartburn, acid indigestion, I mean, back pains. I mean, everything that, 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 everything came back like immediately. And I was like, dang, this stuff is really killing us, man. Why is it that dairy alternatives are not as available to us in our communities when we can't even digest it to begin with? The food that's actually available to us is making us sick and it's making us unhealthy. That's really reprehensible because that's an egregious form of institutional racism. To intentionally harm the health of a large swath of our population so that industry operatives can profit from it. was educating myself on fibroids. I googled it, I talked to people, found out that 70% of women have fibroid tumors and a lot of black women really suffer from fibroid tumors. There came a time when I said, okay, I'm gonna stop taking birth control. I'm gonna stop putting all this stuff in my body, get my body to rest. Well, in 2014, I went ahead and had the surgery and had them removed. 
But in the course of me getting ready for that surgery, and then even after, I was educated on what foods are iron-rich foods that I would definitely need because I was suffering from anemia. I was always tired, always cold. People would always tell me, eat red meat. Eat red meat because it gives you more protein. Eat red meat because it builds up your blood. I gorged myself on meat. I went off birth control. And then I found out I had 22 fibroids. And so I was like, okay, every day, it was like a record scratch on my life. You know, I was like, this is crazy because I knew I wanted kids. There was no way I could get pregnant with that many fibroids. So thankfully, I was able to have the surgery to get those eliminated. And I just made a complete change in my thought and what I thought about food right after the surgery. I said, you know what? I'm not going to be eating the same things I ate before. I got to live better. My body's a temple. You know, I felt like I was able to start over after that. I am thankful to be at this point to where my fibroids are gone. There is a possibility of them coming back, but I live my life trying to make sure that I give my body every chance in the world to do right. So when someone approaches me like you did about eating vegan or just introducing me to a new way of healthier living, why would I not want to try that? Because I've seen the other side of it. I've seen the intensive care unit. I've seen what happens when your blood's not built up enough from nutrients. I've seen all that. And so why would I not, you know, try something new? PCRM did a study looking at diet and menstrual issues, but specifically fibroids. And what we know is that diets that have a lot of compounds in them that stimulate inflammatory hormones and compounds within our bodies increase the risk of developing fibroids and or the severity of the symptoms that are associated with having them. And again, animal foods are the leading culprit in that regard because they stimulate the growth of fibroids and also make them much more painful and symptomatic if a woman develops them. So after learning all this stuff, my question was, if a plant-based vegan diet is scientifically proven to be healthier for you and prevent diseases, why aren't our doctors giving us this information? 50 years of research have told us that plant-based foods are healthiest. So you're not gonna hear that from your doctor. And the reason that you're not is because doctors get four hours or fewer of nutrition in their entire four years of medical school, if they get it at all. In Western medicine, we operate from the disease model. We are in the business of treating sick people I think it's unrealistic as a populace for us just to expect physicians being ignorant and having a strong financial interest not to, to tell us anything about nutrition at all. We pay doctors through third-party insurances and those insurance companies will pay me to prescribe a drug to you, but they won't pay me to sit and talk to you for a half an hour to an hour about changing your diet. There's a lot of people who buy into the standard U.S. Western medical science, you know. And I, I think our community deserves better than that. And we need a holistic approach. So when I see people of color repping the holistic, then it gets interesting. The entire medical industrial complex, ranging from the insurance companies, the hospitals, they all have an interest in the population as a whole continuing on and advancing the nutricidal pattern of food consumption that we have. It is popular in the mainstream vegan movement to actually promote veganism as a cure-all, making people feel as if it's the individual's responsibility to take control of their health and it really um, ignores a lot of the systemic factors that actually make it difficult for a lot of people to come to, to the health or the harmony that they need.
Kaiser Permanente is finally endorsing a plant-based diet for optimum health. So the more light that we shed on these issues, the more we force the powers that be to come clean. If one cop kills one black person a month, people march. They put it all over social media, and they really gun for change, which they should. Then you have diseases killing members of our community by the millions. Does the violence inflicted upon our bodies through the poor food choices we're given not warrant comparable outrage and attention by activists? It's been set up to keep us almost in a daze of sleep. We need to politicize our food choices. Having a healthy body is, is political. Being able to have a lot of energy so that we can fight those larger battles. For some people of color, particularly those who aren't informed about nutrition and so forth, some of the vegan books and films that come from dominant culture that promote veganism, they kind of feel like vehicles for social imperialism. We come from the hull up, who are you to tell me how to live my life, who are you to tell me how to eat kind of mentality because of our history and it's justified. A lot of the ways that um, organizations communicate, they use a very missionary and colonialistic approach. For example, we're going to go and teach those people how to eat properly. It assumes that these particular groups, which are usually non-white communities, working class communities, uh, they've become the white man's burden. They don't have wisdoms or knowledge systems that are um, of equal value or even better value in terms of understanding their own nutrition. We're in the age of Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter on so many different levels. And for me, I come at that as a food scholar by saying, yeah, we do. So that means our whole life matters. Our histories, our present, our future. And so when we're in this space where everyone is telling us what we should be doing, both in the community and from outside the community, I see that as a need and a desire to rule my black body. You need to bring me in line. I need to walk a certain way, I need to talk a certain way, I need to eat a certain set of foodstuffs in order to be an acceptable black body in this particular cultural moment. As much as I would like to see people adopt a plant-based diet, I can't force it on people. I'm providing information so that you can make an informed decision and then I let it go. That's it. I'm not vested in it beyond that. Not everybody's gonna do it. It took me a long time to realize that. Not everybody is going to do it. And then there's the matter of access. I remember I was watching this food documentary on veganism and then this white chick, she was making a point about how easy it is to go vegan. Like, you can just go to your neighborhood health store. And I'm watching this like, okay, you know, for the affluent white woman living in an upper middle class neighborhood with the Whole Foods on the corner, like I'm sure it is easy to just go vegan. But a lot of minority neighborhoods don't have health food stores. And why is that? Why is it that people living in minority neighborhoods don't have access to fresh, affordable, healthy food? And why isn't that a point worth bringing up? A food desert, by definition, is an area where there is not access to either a grocery store or healthy foods within like a mile or more. Unless the neighborhood is going through gentrification, where there are more affluent young whites moving in, then you start to see these healthier options coming. I grew up surrounded by nothing but fast food chains and carryouts. I didn't even have the awareness to see that as a problem. The closest grocery store that I go to is Safeway. And they have organic vegetables and foods there. But sometimes I do find that I'm not pleased with the way a lot of their vegetables look. Like, look at this, like this doesn't look, it doesn't look fresh. It's fresh. This is the kind of organic stuff you have here. Many people who are working one to two jobs, they're not making living wages. And so the ability for them to afford the food is just too high. 
You also have people who have to use various means of transportation in order to get access to healthy food. We found out recently that one area where the bus actually prohibits people who are riding the bus to take more than two bags of groceries on the bus. Well, if your means of getting your fresh groceries is going to be on a bus and you can only bring two bags of groceries home and you have children, that's going to make things very difficult for you. Health is the front lines. You can't just have health just in a vacuum of privilege, right? Health is about access. It's about economics. It's about the psychology. It's about the organization of the community to provide certain things. Most of us can figure out the biggest incentives for exploiting others, which is profit. That word drives so many too often to look other ways to approve their actions that they would not normally, they would not normally stand up to scrutiny. Under capitalism, both humans and animals are typically working for the profit of others. A system which is inherently about exploiting and keeping them oppressed sees no problem in allowing it to continue. I founded Food Empowerment Project and I currently run it. We are a vegan food justice organization where we work to encourage people to go vegan for the sake of the animals. We also work on access to healthy foods in communities of color and low income communities because the lack of access to healthy foods in this country has become a privilege instead of a right, which it should be. Back in D.C., one of the guys I went to high school with, Ronnie Webb, School Without Walls, 04 baby, he started a nonprofit called The Green Scheme. And on a grassroots level, his organization goes into at-risk communities, which are predominantly communities of color, and they promote health awareness. They teach people about urban agriculture techniques. The Green Scheme, they also use urban agriculture as a weapon to help people in the community get back against lack of access. Urban agriculture is basically growing food in the city and growing it in crazy places, or I guess what people would consider crazy places. So right now, we're behind an apartment complex in Southeast DC and we have a hoop house. I also went to school without walls with Xavier. When I went to interview him in his garden, he let me take some of his lettuce. And his lettuce game was real strong. I mean, real strong, but um, I'm engaged. We're trying to create something new that the people control, that the people dictate to create new access to food. So right now, anybody that lives in the surrounding community or neighborhood, in a few months will have access to kale, collard greens, turnip greens, carrots, tomatoes, some more okra, beets, radishes, all types of stuff. That's awesome. Like, it's, it's perfect. It's a perfect fruit. It's a perfect vegetable right there, God just was like, there it is, go eat that. In order to be healthy, we can't settle for foods that kill us. So the same way we rally for police in neighborhoods to get their situation together, let's rally for clean, organic, affordable food in our neighborhoods. So there's the issue of access, but let's say more people in marginalized communities had access to healthier, affordable food. Would they eat it? People don't understand how nutrition affects our bodies, how it affects our wellness, how it affects our appearance, how it affects our energy levels. But we are taught the importance of having a mobile phone. I mean, if we got cable, if we got the new Ewans, you know what I mean? Whatever, if we can pull that off, you know, shoes is like $350 now. I'm like, jeans is $150, you know, a piece. So in the hood, we the freshest it get. So, but then we skimp on what really matters. Somebody got to say that, because that's not politically correct. You say that, you catch all kind of flat. But real talk, I don't want to see no Ewans on my feet, you know what I mean? And I'm eating Dairy Queen. Give me the organic, super kale grown down the block, you know what I mean? And I wear some flip flops. Eating plant-based meals, that's an invisible choice. It won't get you the nods and the high fives and the Instagram likes as Jordans or a nice hair weave. But you really gotta question yourself if your desire to be seen as fresh outweighs your desire to actually be fresh and healthy.
And don't even psych yourself out with, oh, but it's too expensive. There's plenty of ways to be vegan on a budget. Do you spend your, your money here or do you spend it on medicine later on? Go to EWG.org, which stands for Environmental Working Group, and they have a list of the fruits and vegetables that are most sprayed and least sprayed. The least sprayed are by default organic, but they don't carry the higher price tag. And swap out your white rice for brown rice. Swap out your white pasta for whole grain pasta. These things are easy to do and they're cheap. It's really not a matter of a vegan diet being more expensive than a carnivorous diet. It more so depends on what you buy, because when I wasn't a vegan, I would turn to salmon for protein. Now, three or more salmon steaks, that will run me like $10 or more. Whereas if I get a block of organic tofu, which is three servings of protein, that only runs me $1.99. Of course, if I decide to get the fancy vegan crab cakes from Whole Foods, like that's gonna set me back. Same thing with eating out, or we decide to do Asian, my veggie chow mein is gonna be cheaper than the shrimp chow mein. So if you eat meat, you eat within your means. If you're a vegan, you eat within your means. I'm of the perspective because of my own experience. That I've been on plant-based since I was on food stamps. You know what I mean? So it wasn't a question. It was about, oh, this ain't healthy? Well, the same hustle I applied to whatever else, I'm about to apply my hustle to getting the food the organic. Hustle something that's not gonna kill us, but it's gonna make us healthy, you know what I'm saying? And you can still, Use the same mentality on flipping something, on selling something, on pitching it. So yeah, so I'm gonna take you guys to see my girl, Chef Nina, and she's gonna put y'all on some vegan game. Do you know the menu? Did she tell you the menu yet? She told me the menu, but I don't want to tell you guys. Okay, here we go. No, it's not a here we go type of I don't want to tell you. It's like, it's so delicious. I want you guys to be surprised. Mm, here come the bubble guts. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, here? Yeah. I tasted my first piece of vegan steak, I think about 15 years ago. Yeah, and I hated it. Some time ago, some vegan food tastes like styrofoam with barbecue sauce on it. I'm not gonna lie, but that has changed tremendously. If you really need that meaty taste, they have a lot of good products on the market to accommodate you and help you transition to meat, and they're bomb. Recently, I went to check out this new company called Impossible Foods that makes plant-based meat alternatives. Impossible Foods' goal is to make meat and cheese-like products from plants. We're not just simply trying to make a veggie burger. We want to have a product that's identical to the taste, the cooking, and the smell of meat. It was on point. Alternative meat sources help people transition because it doesn't break up their routine. Someone who eats chicken on a daily basis or likes to eat beef and there's a product that is similar to what they're used to having, the same taste, they're gonna be more willing to implement that into their diet. If you have a veggie burger that tastes close enough to meat, man, just give me the damn veggie burger. So I'm gonna have you join me in the kitchen. Come on in. Uh -oh. okay. yeah, this is our I even ran some vegan taste tests on my friends to see if they could get down with the taste. And trust me, they wouldn't laugh for me. Like, like not even for my film. These flapjacks are almost ready. So. Flapjacks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use the terminology that wow. brings you yeah, on. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna come over and put one on each of your plates. And then we've got coconut butter with mango whipped in. So just so I'm clear, for, for the mango butter, you're saying all you did was coconut oil and then mango and blended it together? Yes, and blended it together. Nice. I All right. That. So it's hot. Let's start with Let that because we're going to have quite a bit to eat. Okay. The more appealing, the more beautiful it is, the more you're going to no, enjoy it, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and have fun Excellent with food. Thank you. Have fun with Thank food you because so you know much. what? As a chef, this plate is my palace. What do you think so far? This is delicious. Is it good? 
Yeah, I'm going to zoom it a little bit. In a minute, right? Yeah. And one that is really protein plants. You don't have a lot of fillers, gums that are going to clog the arteries, clog the body up, That's and why I make stay away you from feel right. Exactly. But what we want to stay away from is that poor can have these pancakes. Huh? Uh, <laughs> let me walk right down that aisle. The other thing that's important in um, the vegan diet, as in any diet, life is sweet, right? So we have to have some sweets. So I think that should segue us into our next meal Desserts? or dessert. Yeah. Yes. So we're gonna do Boom. a fun dessert. Okay. So we're gonna make a chocolate pudding. Everybody okay? With that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we're not gonna use the typical cream and all the different things that go into that to make a pudding. So what's gonna make it creamy? Avocados. Avocados. <laughs> and we're just going to uh, get that going. <laughs> Tell them that you put it in. <laughs> Look at that texture. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? So I'm more excited about this because it's pudding and from what I understand, I'm not the only lactose intolerant person at the table. No That's right. one at this table. But now is, you're giving us pudding, yeah, so we're, we're super all excited. We're lactose intolerant. <laughs> so let's do this. I'm just going to scoop. And then, once again, because I like options, I've got some raspberries. I've got a little bit of granola. And then I have some desiccated coconut flakes. This is like the lightest. If you mm -hmm. never told ever me what was in this, I would. You wouldn't know. Yeah. A lot of times I don't. And we're eating it right out of the blender, but if it was ice cold, right. oh my oh, yeah. goodness. And yes, you can do that. You know, for somebody who didn't eat vegan before, you sure didn't murder that pudding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> you did some damage on that pudding. I will say, <laughs> this There's is no delicious. Thank you. This is delicious. <laughs> you have, I am a believer. Thank you. What? You need to stay in your bowl. <laughs> I love my friends. <laughs> but as you can see, like vegan food is legit, it's, it's cool. And what I like about it is in the kitchen, it challenges you. A lot of people may need to take cooking classes and that's fine, that's perfectly okay. Go to vegan restaurants or vegan friendly restaurants and explore different dishes. You may need to expand your repertoire, but it's definitely not limiting. It's gonna actually open you up to having something more than just chicken on your plate. Well, all these breakfast cereals over here are vegan. That's my lane. That's the one that I'm driving in. I'm just gonna put some almond milk or soy milk on top of that and call it a day. What, pasta is already vegan? Amen. This is like, you know what, all these ramen noodles that we're about to eat, this is affordable, this is my life. You know, Taco Bell, we're not going to put any sour cream or cheese on this. We're going to have these bean burritos, and this seven-layer burrito is now a five-layer burrito, but that's still going to be okay. And what? The cinnamon twists are vegan. This is what we're going to eat. Part of my vegan journey was retraining my taste buds. It's not necessarily that hot wings taste better than kale. It's just, I grew up eating hot wings. I've eaten hot wings for decades. This is the funny thing. People talk about vegan food as though it exists outside of our food system. Like, you know, like, I'm gonna eat this apple and this is a vegan apple. The apple was already vegan before we put a qualifier on it. Vegan food isn't nasty. It is our perception of food and our insistence of putting food into little boxes and labeling things very specifically. When I first tasted kale, I was like, okay, this is some nasty shit. Like, it was all bitter. But because I knew how good it was for you, I, I just started eating it despite the taste. And eventually, I started to like it. Now I'm hooked. You can juice it with some strawberries and bananas, coconut water, boom. So just having like, just trying out new things, kale chips, so many different things, you know, you can explore. Dr. Milton Mills did two great lectures, Are We Designed to Eat Me and The Biology of Disgust, both on YouTube. My favorite argument is when he compared humans to natural carnivores. 
So you take a lion. If a lion sees like a live piece of meat, a zebra, or even like a gazelle carcass, you know, he's gonna salivate and get excited. He's gonna wanna bite into it. But with humans, if I see a live cow or a pig carcass, by nature, I'm gonna be disgusted. Like I'm not gonna wanna bite into it. In order to consume it, humans have to take off the head, take away the fur, take away the feathers. We have to take away everything that reminds us it's an animal. And then we add seasoning to it, pepper, onion, basil, oregano, which are all plant-based seasonings. Then we have to cook it to completely change the properties. So what we're really doing that we don't realize is we're taking this meat and we're trying to make it taste more plant-like. He made some other good points too. It wouldn't be my style to shy away from sex because it's a huge part of the human experience. So let's do it. I just... What you put into your body affects your hygiene, particularly your body odor. So when I ate garbage, I was not 100% pleased with my smell south of the border. I mean, it was by no means catfish, but there was just this like, you know, all day odor after a long day or a run at the gym. And so if a man wanted to be intimate, I didn't feel comfortable going right into it. I would always say, oh, let me go pee. And I would run to the bathroom and do a smell check. And then once I changed to a more plant-based diet, let's just say when you eat clean, you smell clean. No matter what time of day, you won't need to do smell checks. You know, there's a lot of talk around the politics of respectability with black women and that we don't talk about things like that. And if you're a person who has a womb and a vagina and you're dealing with certain issues like inflammation, um, PMS, or you're dry and it's hard to engage in you know, sexual intercourse, you may not know that certain things you're doing could affect that. Furthermore, there's actually an association with plant-based diets and both potency and virility. Studies have shown that the more meat and animal food that people eat, their fertility tends to go down, and also their virility, their ability to perform in the bedroom is that much less. I'm in my late 50s and I don't have any problems with functioning. <laughs> I'm 51 years old now. I like when I hear that and I know that, but I don't have to take any blue pills or yellow pills. I don't have to take any pills to be John Sally. <laughs> My wife taps me, I tap her back. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote that shit. Oh my God, I can't believe I said it. And for any man struggling with erectile dysfunction, I would urge you, try a plant-based diet. According to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, impotence is a blood flow condition that stems from poor vascular health. So if you adopt a plant-based diet, your arteries open up. And when your arteries open up, blood flow starts and someone else will probably stand up. I used to feel cool, like going places, you know, and based on my appearance, you know what I'm saying? You don't think like you see me, you be like, this nigga don't eat meat, this nigga a vegan. You know what I'm saying? You don't, know, based on our appearance, based on my appearance, you wouldn't think that. And I used to get such a kick and thrill out of, oh no, I don't partake in that stuff right there, man. That stuff a kick. You know what I'm saying? Like, I used to motivate, you know what I'm saying? It was motivate, it made me feel good. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm just eager to get back to that leader king, king mentality, oh. man. Just tighten all the way back up again, man. I love it. For real. I love it. And lead by example, man. Lead by example. My fiance and I used to work at the same production company and his male friends would give him so much crap over the vegan lunches I used to give to him. Like it was it was all in fun, but it kind of hinted at this idea that there was something effeminate about, you know, salads and plant-based foods. And there's always been this association with men and their big rack of ribs on the grill and this idea that like real men eat meat. Yeah, I eat the meat of a coconut, eat a banana. But as far as eating a dead animal, that doesn't make you a real man. I get so angry 
about the gendering of food. I'm angry at the mainstream community that thinks that veganism or like eating vegetables is feminizing and that eating meat is fetishized as more masculine. And I also get angry with, with vegan activists who try to fight against that toxic masculinity by presenting veganism as not threatening somehow to masculinity. Like, no, 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 you can still be masculine and, and eat tofu. I had a colleague tell me he went home for the holiday and when they were passing the ham and everything, he didn't take any and his, his grandmother said, oh, you, you didn't get any ham. He said, no, grandma, you know, I stopped eating it. And it wasn't her response, it was the other men around the table who immediately began to associate that with feminization. Aren't you gonna try some of my honey roasted ham? I'm, I'm afraid I don't, I don't eat pork, man. Don't eat pork. A black man that don't eat pork is a traitor to his race. I've never, I've never eaten vegan before. I don't know. It's gonna be a whole new taste experience. It is. They got, they got the tacos. I don't understand what type of taco meat they're gonna have in the tacos. Like, what does it say they have? Um, walnut cranberry meat. <laughs> 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 this is why I say people think food is just food. No, it is filled with so many layers, right, of expectation, of anticipation, of you should, you shouldn't. It is a heavy, heavy, heavy material object that carries so much power. The masculine aspect of my diet is really that I eat for energy. I eat to empower myself. I eat as a form of discipline, but I choose to be disciplined. You know, to me, that's an expression of masculinity. You live by a code. You live by your wisdom, your experience. These are things that I attribute to manhood. When I see men frown up at healthy foods, it shows me a lack of awareness, like a lack of regard for your own well-being and just a lack of ambition to want to do better for yourself. And those are qualities that I associate with children, not men. Real masculinity is not about arrogance, it's about humility and about compassion and caring and doing one's part within the overall scheme of things for the greater good. And you get to be 45 and 50 and you're doped up on pills. You now are just starting to get old enough to really develop some wisdom and that you can really be the patriarch. But if you're vegan, it helps you stay in line with your life purpose. And that's what masculinity is all about. Being a protector, being on purpose, being vital so that you can provide. Not wrong, but the vegan side. Yeah. Is that ranch or boy dipping in a ranch one time? So this is a, uh, was it buffalo cauliflower? Mm. I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna fuck a bomb. You said what? I said bomb. Oh yeah. <laughs> definitely take these down. There's all this focus on women and how we feel about our bodies and oh, all women want to look like Barbie. In the same sentence, men want to look like G.I. Joe. So because there's this myth that becoming vegan makes one really skinny, a lot of men won't even entertain a plant-based diet. So this all looks beautiful, mm. colorful, laid Thank out, you. displayed. There's no meat here. None. Which is blowing my mind. Right. And I like to work out, yeah. you know, keep my muscles tight and right. How, this doesn't look like it would help. This looks like I would pass out in my workout. Sure, and I understand what you're saying and what you're thinking. The thing I love about this, we could put legumes in this. That's gonna give you um, more protein to bulk up. So you've got your garbanzo beans, your black beans, your white beans, your kidney beans, red beans, and then you can get into your lentils, black eyed peas. We have what's called muscle dysmorphia. So we wanna be swole, you know what I mean? Cause all the superheroes are swole. 
You know what I mean? Superman is swole, you know. Everybody who is a man is swole. So if you don't fit that athletic bill, then what's your psychological disposition? Men don't have to sacrifice their weight to switch to a healthy plant-based diet. David Carter, NFL defensive lineman, 300 pound vegan. A gorilla is 800 pounds. Raw food is. A cow is 1,000 pounds. Raw food is. Hippopotamus, raw food is. Elephant, vegan. Giraffe, vegan. The largest mammals on the planet don't eat meat. Eat Plants, Lift Iron, my book that I wrote with my wife and my trainer, Scott Shetler, was an experiment. I'm a long distance runner. I've been skinny all my life, but I want to show the power of plants. And I want to gain 20 pounds. Everybody say, yeah, you can gain weight, but you can't be doing all that cardio. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to keep running. I went from 167 to 187. And you don't have to mess up your liver and your kidneys, taking all kind of powdered, isolate protein, all this stuff, and spending $80 a keg. You know, it's just real foods. I eat a lot of pumpkin seeds, a lot of yams. There are several male athletes who've accomplished fit physiques on a plant-based diet. So how did your game change when you became a vegetarian? Do you feel like that impacted your game? Oh yeah, well, I went vegetarian in my sixth year. It was so funny because I was like 235. I went down to 219. My cousin said I looked like a black match running up and down the bar. But uh, <laughs> I no longer had back pain. I used to always have back problems. I found out I had a compacted colon. All that sugar, all that iced tea, shellfish, uh, lobster, and, and shrimp. Literally, I would have back pains two or three days. Your body is going into spasm trying to get it out. Back problems. This is what happens when you eat things that don't digest. Before I became vegan, I got up to about 167 pounds. And I had mixed emotions about that size. Like part of me knew I shouldn't get caught up in this whole like Eurocentric idea of beauty that revolves around being really skinny. But you know, deep down, I cannot deny the fact that I just wanted to be skinnier. I don't even like saying that out loud. So when I first went vegan, I, I went down like 20 pounds over the course of a few months without working out or anything. And then my weight pretty much, it just stabilized. Instead of doing the slow climb it was doing when I ate meat. But aside from the physical change, becoming vegan, it helped me develop a whole new relationship with my body. When my weight was higher, I was eating garbage. You know, I was drinking all the time. I was never working out. So I was in this constant state of guilt and constantly mad at myself because I couldn't maintain a six. I, I didn't love my body. I didn't take pride in it. But now, size six or not, I don't have that guilt because I know I eat the way that I'm supposed to. So when you value yourself, it changes the relationship you have with your body, whether you are four or 14. Better watch your step She's gonna break your heart in two It's true I started modeling and I was always, my whole life, a very small person. My family, they're all very, meaning very thin people. I grew up on meat and potatoes kind of diet and um, you know, vegetables were just kind of an afterthought. <laughs> My relationship with food has always been tricky. I actually grew up dealing with eating disorders. I don't think I ever really got pleasure from food or enjoyed it until I started eating this way. I actually started eating for nourishment and it's been a really big part of my healing journey. Not focusing so much on numbers, sizes, but really how am I feeling, how am I looking, how's my energy, how's my overall health, how's 
my mind house all these other things that really matter. Women of color, we tend to have more curves. You know, personally, I didn't get to ask, but you know, you win some, you lose some. But for some women, veganism can come across as an attack on the black female body image. People have good intentions when they're saying, this is what you can look like if you take on this particular type of diet. I noticed with the research I had done in the last 12 years, looking at visual representations of the better or perfect vegan body, images mostly of white or light-skinned people, thin people, um, younger people, able-bodied people. Most people aren't even thinking about it when they put campaigns out to go vegan, when they um, choose who they're going to model for a magazine that is pro-vegan or animal rights or vegetarian. Understand that, hey, we are actually excluding most of the world if we continue to um, promote that the pure or the healthy vegan body adheres to all of these ideas around health that's actually connected to whiteness. It took a while before I actually came across vegan women of color who even had a fuller body type. So I actually believed this idea that if you eat vegan, you, you automatically become really skinny. I try not to kind of perpetuate that rhetoric and understand that there's plenty of evidence that shows that there are people of all body types that are healthy and unhealthy depending on their you know nutritional situation just like a meat-based diet you know people who follow plant-based diets will have different aesthetic outcomes it depends on how much you eat whether you still consume a lot of carbs or if your foods are high in sugar how much you work out and so forth and you look at j-lo serena beyonce they all endorse plant-based eating and they have curves for days actually the first time I have more curves than I've ever had. My weight has been pretty consistent for these entire 30 years. I'm told and I believe that I look younger than I am. Thank you. And that's a huge benefit for me. And I honestly see veganism as a window. This is the way that I'm living to be happy, to be healthy, to be fulfilled. If I step in your kitchen and it looks dirty, like I'm not eating anything from it, not even a sealed bag of chips, I'm good. So I look at these factory farms with the same scrutiny because that's where the meat is held that's supposed to go in my body. And the more videos I saw on modern farming practices, there's no way I'm eating that. There's no way I'm ever gonna give that to my child. Like you have dead and diseased animals mixed in with the live ones, standing in their own poop for weeks. Nothing about that registers is clean to me. And then I was reading Tracy's book by Any Greens Necessary, and apparently they allow a certain percentage of feces in the meat. So I'm good. When cows are going through that slaughterhouse process and they're sliced, they're hung up on metal hooks and their stomachs are sliced open, everything falls out onto the equipment. The way animals are murdered, the way they are gathered, the way they are farmed, the diseases they carry, that right there should be enough not to eat it. If I took you to this place downtown, Los Angeles, this chicken, warehouse, whatever they want to call it. And at a certain time of day when they are murdering all the chickens, you can smell the death. And there's people lined up to get these chickens because they felt, well, they killed them fresh. And I sat there and I couldn't believe the smell. If you were to smell where they were, you wouldn't want to eat. A lot of people say, well, I don't eat chicken anymore, I don't eat beef, so I eat fish. And they can't seem to let go of the fish. Fish is the holdout, that's the thing. There must be some meat on their plate and it's gonna be a fish. Fish is contaminated with mercury and with arsenics and with other industrial pollutants. And it gets in the flesh of the fish and you cannot cook it out. There are also a lot of parasites in the water that get into the fish's digestive tract. Let me tell you, I went fishing maybe three, four years ago. I don't want to totally gross you out, but I have this very graphic image in my head where I'm like, it made it hard for me to ever eat fish because I got it out the water and all of these worms came out of it. I'm not joking. And they had someone on deck that like, you know, cut the fish for you, prepared it. And they were like, oh, it's normal. 
this may have been the way it's always been, right? But this is not the way it's going to be moving forward. So people turn their noses up at a diet that consists of fresh fruits and vegetables, but parasite infested disease rotting meat with 2% crap in it is okay. So we'll go ahead and head in here if you want to follow me. And I'll let you know who likes their space, who's friendly. Some of the goats and sheep here are really shy and kind of don't want as much attention, so we want to make sure we keep them comfortable. Is she goes over to every person and demands pets. It's a two T. I think so. I just. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure we cool. Just want to make sure we cool. <laughs> about 260 million male chicks are killed every single year in the U.S. upon their birth. Um, and this is done with really cruel methods, such as being electrocuted on an electrified kill plate, um, being gassed, or simply just being thrown into a trash can to suffocate. Hi, my name is Genesis, and I'm eight years old. I am vegan and an activist because I don't believe animals should be put in slaughterhouses and circuses. People don't have to eat animals to live. All my favorite foods like pizza and mac and cheese, I can still eat in a vegan version. I became an activist to protest for what's right to show kids they have a voice. I help people who are blinded, they don't know what's happening to the animals. I'm here for a purpose. My purpose is to get the whole world to go vegan. Thank you for helping me. Peace. She wasn't even four years old. She always had chicken nuggets. That was her favorite meal at the time. She said, hey, Mom, where do we get our food from? And I told her we kill animals for the food that she was eating, and she was devastated. And I didn't even know she knew what death meant at that age. And she said, well, we have to kill. What is it? I said, well, chickens and cows. And she said, you know what? I don't ever want to eat this again. My six-year-old brother, I told him one day when we were driving, there was a squirrel and it was ran over. And he said, look, it's a dead squirrel. I'm like, yeah, that's the same as your meat and stuff. And he said, no, it's not. I said, yeah, because they kill animals for it. And how do you like that? He said, I don't like that. So then he, he went vegetarian. And then I f convinced him to go vegan just from him saying, you know the milk that you're drinking comes from a mama cow's boob? And I was like, do you like to drink out of mama cow's boob? And he said, I don't want to drink out of no one's boob. So I was like, yeah, go vegan. Up until a few years ago, I really didn't care about animal rights. I'm not proud of that at all, but it's the truth. I remember when I was working at a talent agency years ago, and one of the actresses came in telling me about how she rescued this baby squirrel, and she took said squirrel to a rescue shelter in Malibu, where he had a cliffside view of the ocean, organic acorns, and whatever the hell else. And I remember I was just so annoyed, because I was like, you know what, somewhere there's a squirrel that's living the life better than me. And my irritation at that moment kind of summed up how I felt about animal rights. like. This is a privileged issue. Unfortunately, it's in some ways that it is, because we do afford the ability to be worried about another species, to be worried about what's happening to animals when many people are just striving for survival. If you are living in an inner city where you're dodging bullets just to get home, or you are struggling just to put food on the table from day to day, those are your primary concerns and you have less time, less energy, less mental space to devote to seemingly as esoteric as animal rights. I think people who are doing vegan outreach or trying to campaign for veganism, they have to be aware of that and that when you just approach someone and say that um, you should focus only on saving animals, it makes invisible the material struggles that most of the people in the United States, if not the world, have in just trying to survive as humans themselves. I acknowledge that we as a movement need to be better about that. I don't think it means us going into communities of color and saying this is what you should and shouldn't do. It doesn't mean comparing slavery to animals and things like that, which I find offensive. I think it's more looking at these structures that have been in place that exploit and kill living beings. We've been robbed collectively of our empathy 
I want black people to have that empathy back. Maybe I'll try to take out meat from my diet once a week, or maybe I'll stop using makeup that is tested on animals. To start where you're at, and not make it about, you know, just doing this overnight thing. What do you have for lunch? Mm -hmm. <laughs> first thing is <laughs> No, actually, I was thinking about a kale shake already. Nice. I love kale. Monday, I might not have any meat. I might do a little meat this Monday. Yes. Back when humans were hunters and gatherers, violence against animals, it was somewhat justified. You know, they didn't have the wide variety of alternatives we have today. But now, you know, all the sadistic, inhumane animal practices they got going on, they're not only barbaric, but it's completely unnecessary. And coming from a spiritual place, in my opinion, I think the whole thing has just become really ungodly. They get the pigs and stuff and they keep them in cages and then they can barely even move and they take them and they kill them for the food. But we don't have to eat animals. I think it's important that you become inspired by things that make you feel good. And it makes me feel good to know that 7,500 land animals didn't have to die because of me per year. We're handed this narrative that we can only care about one thing at a time. And that if you care about other species, communities, then that somehow mitigates your commitment to black liberation. And that's a lie. That's a lie that white supremacy has given us. We can care about more than one thing. And indeed, we're compelled to care about more than one thing. Because our liberation is linked. Animal liberation and black liberation and queer liberation are all connected to one another. I eventually want to get to a place where abuse is not something so embedded in my lifestyle. I'm challenging people of color. Like, I'm calling my people to task. The same way we want people to take arms for our cause. The same way we want people to be compassionate for us. You know, I put the ball in your court. Like, if you see this cruelty, if it doesn't bother you, okay, sit tight. But if you know in your heart that what happens in these tapes is wrong, be strong and be disciplined enough to eat that conviction. For me, I grew up in D.C. and I had certain examples, right. you know. I had the, the strong black woman, the independent black woman. I didn't have the compassionate black woman. So that's why there's like a break in my empathy. But to hear a woman like you, you're setting an example. Like you're an example that a lot of people don't have. Thank so. you. Who, with a heart, can watch. When a cow cries when its calf is taken away from it, mm -hmm. I mean, how can somebody then just be so bold to say, but I have to have this to live when you don't. What right do I have to take another sentient being's life when I don't need it to survive? And what right would I have anyway mm. is what really motivates me. When I first embarked on my own vegan journey, I felt very alone. I felt disconnected from the mainstream vegan community and I didn't see myself represented. And that's a common theme that I've heard other people saying, people of color, every time I've had conversations with them about veganism. It's immediately off-putting to them because the way that veganism is offered to us, it seems like this almost elitist thing that is only available for certain segments of the population. I worry sometimes about being used as a token instead of recognizing that we have every right to be there. We have just as much knowledge and experience to be talking on these issues, and you don't need to just bring me out when the chateada, which is the Mexican rodeo, comes to town. I can't tell you how many people come up to me, mostly young women of color, who say, do you know how good it feels to have someone who looks like me up there? The need is out there, but we have a movement that seems to be very focused on not us. <laughs> And if you don't want to do it for the animals, do it for people, do it for our community. Animal rights and human rights intersect. You know, we live in an ecosystem. Where do you think they put in these factory farms? When you look at factory farming and animals raised for food, you also see this taking place where you have high concentrated amounts of manure of animals and where these animals are being raised are in communities of color. So in North Carolina you have predominantly black communities living around pig farms where they are suffering from nosebleeds and headaches and nausea. They can't open their windows because the flies and the stench 
their property values go down because who wants to live near a pig farm? So that's why by stopping eating animal products, by not drinking that milk, by not eating any animal products, you are not participating in a system that also causes harm to communities living in these areas, which are predominantly communities of color. And that's just scaling it down to a smaller problem specific to our communities. This is a worldwide problem. Raising animals for human consumption consumes enormous amounts of resources. One of the reasons that global hunger is such a problem is because we grow enough food to feed every human being on this planet several times over. But the reason there's a shortage of food is because we take that food and instead of eating it directly, we turn around and feed it to animals. And that, in essence, creates scarcity. Because roughly estimated, it takes about 13 pounds of feed to put one pound of tissue on a cow. The largest source of greenhouse gas emissions is animal-based agribusiness. Factory farming, the poop and the burps from animals that are factory farmed, they create more global warming emissions than all of the world's transportation combined. And that is the world over. That's just not in the United States. It's the world over. It's the rainforests that are being demolished so that cattle can graze to produce meat. It's the water that's being polluted. It's the soil that's being eroded. So factory farming for meat and dairy-based diets are the biggest contributor to global warming. The real elephant in the room is that a lot of people of color don't really give a bleep about the environment. Even me personally, growing up, like I watched Captain Planet. I never litter. I did Earth Day once or twice in school, but that's like as deep as it got. The examples for that kind of thinking just weren't there in my community. I believe that when we get people to critically think about their world, their behaviors will change as well. Talking about veganism or dietary veganism isn't the only way to get people to not eat meat. The reality is we all need to be thinking about this stuff because we all live on planet Earth. So th this is for someone like me, I'm going to help you out. Please. It's very difficult because everything you said was incredible. But first of all, I couldn't come up with those ingredients. Probably couldn't find them. Yes, you could. And wouldn't know what to do with them. I mean, me, personally, a novice. You have a computer? Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. It's very important for African Americans to teach each other because we have a lot of distrust about what is good for us, what's healthy for us. A lot of times, we don't even trust each other. So it's important who the messenger is. So I commend and applaud all of the folks out there who are getting the message out through social media where it's palatable for everybody to understand. And the folks out there who are getting the message out through hip hop. So what we're trying to do and what we are actually doing is we're making sure that a new thing is born here today. And it's called health and wellness mixed with hip hop. The tenth element of hip hop is health and wellness. So hip hop is the biggest force on planet Earth when it comes to youth. And we want to take that energy and put environmentalism in them, put health and wellness in it, and make sure that this is a sustainable movement that people all around the world can be a part of. I think it's important for the youth to see somebody that's college educated, getting their master's degree, that stand in the community doing work, gives them that sense of, of community and responsibility, and for the elders to know that there's younger people that they can feel happy about. So I think it's just about being a positive influence and kind of just being a good reflection. And I think it's important for everything, you know what I'm saying? Whatever we do, if we can do it in our own space, it like encourages everybody else. And the more black people go vegan, like, you know, the, the higher the potential is for it to become a part of the national consciousness. We've seen trends of black hair being appropriated, our language being appropriated, like have black people go vegan. And I tell you what, in a couple of weeks, like the animal exploitation industry is gonna be shaking in their leather boots because we, have such power. I don't want to be an invisible vegan. I can't teach and uplift others from an invisible space. I want to be the visible black female vegan example I wish I had growing up.
all love. It's all love. It's all love.